I'm sure you can remember growing up and you had that one friend that always tell these ridiculous stories that are hard to believe. And so they'd have to close every narrative with the words, I swear to God, to try to get you to believe them. Or maybe you're the kind of person when you get excited about something, the first thing that comes to mind is to shout out, oh, my God, I'm excited. Or maybe you have times of frustration in Jesus's name is the first thing that comes to mind. But we're going to explore those realities in today's video. My name is Gavin. I'm a pastor here in South Florida at New Springs Church. I also coach basketball. And this is Deep Dives, where we dive deep into issues of theology and culture. Like the video, share it with somebody it might be useful to, and please subscribe to our channel for more content like this. We hope you enjoy. I can distinctly remember growing up and me and one of my good friends, both of our families being from the Caribbean, have kind of this traditional approach to religion and to Christianity in general. And so a very clear no-no in our house was to use God's name in vain. So you couldn't swear to God ever. Not allowed to say it, you get in big trouble. And so we'd try to come up with all of these creative things like we'd say, I swear with a Z. Or we'd say got with a G-O-T as if somehow that absolves us from being guilty of breaking that third commandment. Uh, but I remember me and my friend, we would do that all the time in high school in order to uh, get away from being guilty of breaking that commandment. But why do we do that? Why do Christians do that? Why is it such a big deal? Why, why do songs on the radio that say uh, God and then say damn, like why is that bleeped out? Why is that such an issue? I think three things in understanding naming and, and the authority it bears are helpful in this discussion. Uh, for one, naming something exercises sovereignty. Here's what I mean. Right at the beginning, you have God create Adam and Eve, and God tells Adam and Eve that they're going to have authority, that they're going to exercise dominion over the entire world in God's name. They're bearing his authority. And some of the one of the ways that God gives Adam to do that is he has the authority to name all of the animals, gives them all of their names and emphasizing the fact that human beings have authority over the animals. I mean, we see this practice today still. It's it's parents who named their child, not the other way around or a, a conquering nation, a nation that comes in and takes over a city. They they will name that city whatever they see fit. You think of all the Alexandrias that exist because of the conquests of Alexander the Great. Naming bears authority. And so that's, that's part of some of the discussion today where you have schools and roads named after Confederate generals or questionable people from the past. Do we want this area to bear the authority of somebody that doesn't stand up to the ethics and morals of our nation as a whole? That's a different discussion for a different day. But on the first level, naming something, it exercises a certain measure of control and sovereignty. Secondly, naming something characterizes it. So it, it, it says something about someone. You think about nicknames. I remember growing up watching uh, Agent Zero, Hibachi, uh, Gilbert Arenas. They call him Hibachi because he was always cooking up something hot, scored a lot of points. Kobe Bryant, the Black Mamba, just fierce, vicious, a killer in the basketball sense. Nicknames, of course, tell you something about the person who's bearing that nickname. In the Bible, God uses names in that way as well. You think, for example, of uh, Jacob in the Old Testament. The name Jacob means something like a deceiver. And so Jacob was such a deceptive person, he really characterized his name. And later on, he has this profound moment where God makes a covenant with him and calls him into a new existence, giving him the name Israel. Or you think around the time of Christmas where we think about Joseph and Mary and the Christmas story. And, and the angel Gabriel comes and visits Mary because she's pregnant with this child that's conceived by the Holy Spirit. And he tells her, you will call his name Jesus, for he will save the people from their sins. The name Jesus characterizing what it is. That he's going to do 
And sometimes that's the case. Now, of course, modern day, not a lot of people have names that characterize who they are, who their parents have declared them to be. But that is something that names provide in certain occasions. And then lastly, naming distinguishes. It, it separates this individual or this thing from the host of other individuals or other things that are like it. My, my son, for example, is a five-year-old kindergartner. So how do I call out this specific five-year-old kindergartner in a class of 20 from amongst the others? Well, I'll just call him by his name. His name is Braxton. Hey, Braxton, I'm talking to you. I'm not talking to the other 20 kids that are in the class. And so naming distinguishes and identifies. And so when we think about God, number one, God reveals his name primarily in the book of Exodus to Moses, where uh, Moses wants to go and set the Israelites free from bondage and slavery in Egypt. And so he presumes the question that the people will ask, well, by whose authority, who like what name can I give to actually compel Pharaoh to let these people go? And God reveals his name, his name, Yahweh. I am who I am. And Moses comes with the authority of that name, that that name, Yahweh, it, it characterizes God's singularity and his authority over all people. And God uses several names throughout scripture to characterize who he is and the actions he takes in human history. And then, of course, that name distinguishes God from amongst all of the other gods, it, keeping in mind that at that time it was a polytheistic society where you had gods like like Amun-Ra and other Egyptian gods that the people worshipped. And God says, no, this is my name. I'm distinct from all of those other gods. Well, uh, another issue that I, think, uh, that I think is important to address is that, that bearing a name bestows some kind of honor. So, uh, for example, my, my last name is Felix, right? And so as you think of my last name, you think of my, my father and and his family before him and and everything I do bestows either honor or shame on the family from which I come. And that's just based on the name. The same is true for my kids. They're a reflection of me and I am a reflection of them to, to, to some degree. Um, you think about a a recruiter. So I, I, I coach basketball and uh, one of the things that kids get really excited about at the high school level is anytime you have a college recruiter show up to watch practice or watch a game. And, and it's typically an, an assistant coach or sometimes the head coach and they show up at the gym and they're wearing a polo or they're wearing a quarter zip or something like that or a T-shirt and it has the school's name on it. And so this individual in and of himself may not be necessarily all that important or impressive to the players that's playing, but, but who they represent. I am a representative of Florida state university of Duke university, that name bearing that name bestows honor to that person. And so here's the issue. If I call myself a Christian, think about what that word is. It's little Christ. I am, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I, I bear the name of Jesus in all that I do. The words that I speak, the actions that I take, the motivations that I have, it, whether I want you to or not, everything that I do is going to be reflective about my beliefs about Jesus and about Jesus himself. I bear that name. And so the Bible is really clear that we shouldn't bear names flippantly. That we should take the requisite amount of, of care and um, uh, importance when we think about bearing the name of God in the things that we do. One of the things that, of course, can be egregious is uh, calling yourself a Christian when maybe you're not. When your beliefs aren't lined up with what scripture says. It does, it does damage and it does harm to the name of Christ. We can think somberly about uh, past issues of, of pastors and missionaries and evangelists who've fallen into egregious sin that becomes publicized, uh, the current cases of abuse that reside worldwide of people 
bearing the name of Jesus Christ and doing awful things in his name. We think of the Crusades in the past and all of that. And you can see the results. If I call myself something and do violent things, explicit things in that name, it does harm not just to me and to the victims that are involved, but to the entire authority of that name that I bear. Same is true with our country, with our city, with our neighborhood, with the schools that we attend. We, we bear the name of those institutions and societies, and therefore our actions are somewhat reflective of, of that. I think we need to be really aware of that. That when we call ourselves Christians and we say that we come in the name of God, when I call myself a pastor, you call yourself a, a volunteer of a church or an attendee or a member of a church, it carries a lot of weight. People are going to look at your actions and determine things about Jesus, whether that's fair or not. That is the reality. Secondly, using God's name to, to bolster your your otherwise questionable reputation probably not the best right the, the example that i use to start I, I always remember kids like this who they tell these wild crazy stories probably lying about what they're saying and then by saying i swear to god somehow that adds validity to it it's using god's name in vain see see god's name is characterized by love god's name is characterized by truth by integrity, by faithfulness, by grace, by justice. Those are the things that are accompanied and associated with God's name. And to use God's name to accompany falsehood, to accompany lies, to accompany uh, outrageous things is to use his name in vain. And that's egregious. And we should be careful of doing that. And lastly, using God's name to curse. It's funny. We... Um, when we're really frustrated, annoyed, angered, you want to find the strongest word you can to express that frustration and annoyance. And it's always curious to me that the first name that people go to is often Jesus, is often God. I think there's something to that. I think the, the theology behind that is the fact that God's name, Jesus' name, bears all the authority in the universe. Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus says that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto him. So there's no higher name by which you can you can swear, by, by which you can condemn. And so oftentimes we use that. However, when I'm using God's name to, to curse or to damn something, I'm taking his name and his authority, assuming it for myself and using it to 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 damn something that simply bothers me. Right. Someone that slighted me, that stepped on my shoes, that fouled me in a basketball game or I'm watching my favorite sports team and uh, the coach makes a bad call. And all of a sudden I'm shouting expletives at the TV. Seems I'm not using God's name correctly. Now, lastly, I think this is important as well. Romans chapter two makes the statement that God's kindness and forbearance is intended to lead us to repentance. Here's why that's important. Is it true that after leaving this video, you, you know, trip over the wiring of your computer and fall down and shout Jesus's name? Is a is a thunderbolt going to take you out in that moment? Maybe, but probably not, right? And so sometimes what we do is we conclude, that, well, I've I've used this as an expletive for a long time. Nothing bad's ever happened to me. Maybe I could just keep doing it. Maybe God's okay with it. And I would caution you against using that kind of logic when it comes to bearing God's name. That, that rather what Romans chapter 2 says is that God's kindness and his patience in allowing you to continue on after having committed egregious sins is because he's a kind God. It's because he's a gracious God. It's because he's giving you an opportunity to realize the faults in that error. And have the opportunity to repent. I hope that this video provides that kind of an opportunity. I don't want to make you feel bad, but if you feel bad about the language that you use as a result of having heard this, then maybe that's God calling you to repentance and see that as a grace that God would would tell you where faults are and give you the opportunity to turn to him and be totally and completely forgiven on the spot in that moment, having to do absolutely nothing else. 
just praying to Jesus, calling on his name properly and asking for him to forgive you of your sins. Well, that's the God that we serve, the God that we proclaim, one who can forgive me of tons of egregious sins, but knowing that his grace is all sufficient for me and for you, I pray that you would see him that way. Well, again, I hope that this video is helpful thinking about whether or not I can I can swear in God's name. Please avoid that. Uh, like this video, share it if you found it helpful, and of course, subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you next time. Take care.